Let's turn um, tonight to Luke chapter 1. We're going to be studying the life of Elizabeth. Elizabeth is the mother of John the Baptist. And her story is pretty powerful. As we um, have given some time just to study the women of the Bible, their, their lives are here for our example and for us to learn from and to pattern our lives after them. So with that, let's ask God to, to help us to glean what we're to glean from Elizabeth's life. Join me in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for getting us here tonight. And we come into your house to receive strength, Lord, to receive instruction. We want to learn from the examples that you have written in your word how we as women ought to live. We thank you for the power of your spirit that enables us and equips us to do that which you've called us to do. And Lord, in those impossible situations, we don't want to think about them or dwell on them in the negative. But Father, we lay them before you and we stand upon the promises of your word that with God, all things are possible. And so Father, comfort our hearts tonight and give us, Lord, all that we need to equip us to be these women that you've called us to be in these last days. Father, thank you for the gift of salvation. Thank you for Jesus. Jesus, thank you for being so real to each and every one of us. And so we just commit this evening into your hands, Father, and ask that you just do a mighty work in us and through us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Luke chapter 1. Elizabeth. Now, we're going to call these uh, studies, these lessons, by the woman's name that we're studying, so that will be easy to, um, to identify. But if I was going to title this message, I would title this message, Too Good to be True, because Elizabeth waited a long, long time for her heart's desire to be fulfilled. The book of... Um, the Gospel of Luke is written by Luke. He's the, the beloved physician. He is a accurate historian. In fact, he was the best of his day. And what is nice about the Gospel of Luke is that he writes in chronological order, and he asks um, questions and gets details like any good doctor would, but there's a lot of compassion in the way that this is written and how the, how the Holy Spirit guided him in the truths that are written in um, this gospel. He also, remember, is the one that, wor- that wrote the book of Acts. This is also known as the gospel of praise. It's known as the gospel of prayer, the gospel of childhood, and the gospel of womanhood. Because more women are mentioned in this gospel than any of the others. And so there's a thing of raising up the, the standard for a woman raising her up to a place of dignity and honor and importance and finding out what our work in the ministry is, that we also have a very important part in the work of God. Because at this time, remember, women were scorned and actually looked down upon as a lesser person, lesser than um, even as, as a human being. And to be barren, which was what Elizabeth's case was, that was the worst of all. That was the worst curse any Jewish woman could ever live with. Because to be barren was a sign of God's displeasure. It was a sign that maybe that you were in sin, and this is the reason why you were barren. It was a curse from God to be, to be barren. In fact, it was um, said that uh, a husband could divorce his wife if she didn't bear him children. That was reason for divorce. Not only that, to be excommunicated from God if a woman was barren. So this was a very, very severe um, thing to have to deal with, to be barren at this time. In chapter 1 of Luke, this is where we find out everything that we know about Elizabeth is written in the chapter 1 of Luke. Her name means, and this gives us a good idea of the kind of woman that she was, her name means, my God is an, is an absolutely faithful God. And boy, does she have an awful lot to teach us about standing firm in faith, standing upon the promises of God, hoping in God. If we were going to outline this chapter, 
we could outline it. And I, like I said, uh, Luke is my kind of guy because I love this chronological in order kind of a story rather than, you know, trying to piece it all together. So we see, first of all, we see Elizabeth and Zechariah, and that's verses 5 through 25, just as an outline of the, of the chapter. We see Elizabeth and Mary in verses 39 through 56. This is 80 verses in this chapter. So obviously we're not going to go through each one because you would be here until who knows when. Then we see Elizabeth and Jesus, and that's in verses 41 and 40 through 45, and then Elizabeth and John in verses 57 through 80. And so we see Elizabeth in her relationships with each one of these um, persons. When we look at Elizabeth and Zechariah and the story there, now Zechariah is Elizabeth's husband, and, and Elizabeth proves to be a faithful wife. When Zechariah does not believe, actually chooses not to believe when the angel tells him that his prayer has been answered and that his wife is going to bear a son, Zechariah chooses not to do so, not to believe in that, in, in the word of the Lord. And for the discipline, because it was unbelief, he was disciplined for that, and he was struck deaf and dumb, could not hear or speak until the promise was fulfilled. So for nine months, he had to kind of, you know, deal with his sin. But Elizabeth does not ridicule him. She doesn't put him down because he had a moment that he lacked in trusting God. She doesn't side with him either. I wonder how many wives sometimes when a husband goes astray, I mean, she kind of goes with him just because, I mean, it's too hard to be godly when he's in disobedience. But she doesn't do that. She doesn't move from her faith in God. She doesn't move in, in her standing before the Lord, no matter what it is that her husband's going through. And she becomes then a support to him. And that, that's a good little tidbit for those that are wives here tonight. To allow your husbands to go through their times of chastisement. And these are husbands that are saved or not saved. God's still dealing with them because you are a righteous wife. And so to allow God to speak to this man, to allow God to do the disciplining and not contribute in the sense of uh, ridicule or um, deserting him. Sometimes when our husbands go through it, I, we, we kind of just, you know, I mean, the thought goes through my mind. Well, listen, buddy, you got yourself into that trouble. You just do it, you know, go through it alone. Don't pull me into your big trial. But that's really a wrong attitude to have because we're to come along and support. And sometimes there's not so much that we can say, but boy, we can go into that prayer closet and we can storm heaven on his behalf that God would do whatever it is that he needs to do and that that man would learn that lesson. Her story is exactly the same as Abraham and Sarah's story, except that it is the um, man that doesn't believe instead of the woman. So when I look at Elizabeth's life, Elizabeth was a woman of the word. She knew the Old Testament. She knew the word of God. And she learned from Sarah's life what to do and what not to do because she found herself in the exact same place that Sarah was. So she learns from Sarah's example to believe in the God of the impossible, to believe that God would do above and beyond what she could ever imagine or think. Is this where your faith is? Is this what stirs your heart? To believe that age is not the factor. It has nothing to do with um, God's ability to perform his purposes in us. Age is not a hindrance, in other words. She realized that. She also prayed with expectation. She understood the power of prayer. And when she prayed, there was an expectation. She expected God to answer her prayer. She left that up to him. She knew that her prayers weren't just, um, you know, falling to the ground, but they were, they were, they were hitting the, the ears of God. It says in verse 36, this is an interesting thing. Now, let me tell you how how we get here to verse 36 in chapter 1. Mary, the mother of Jesus, has, has just been told that she will miraculously conceive the Messiah. And the angel Gabriel makes the announcement and tells Mary all about that. And then the angel is going to give Mary a sign to confirm that what is, what is happening is, is real. And he says, and behold, he says this to Mary, the mother of Jesus, verse 36, and behold thy cousin Elizabeth, 
She hath also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her. In other words, she's six months pregnant, who was called barren. And notice verse 37. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. Gabriel was quoting the Old Testament promise that was given to Sarah regarding Isaac. Nothing is too hard for God. And so he's bringing about the fulfillment of the Old Testament into the New. And he reminds Mary and gives her a sign. And he speaks these phenomenal words. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. And he's saying to Mary, remember divine intervention. And here she has, not only is she now pregnant in a miraculous way, but her cousin Elizabeth is also. So that's the question I pose to you tonight. Do you believe in the God of the impossible? Each and every one of us faces impossible situations. These are the opportunities of God to work in a miraculous way. But I must believe and put my trust in the God of the impossible. Do you believe in divine intervention? He says he's the same today, yesterday, and forever. And if God divinely intervene on these women's behalf, will he not do the same for us? A God who is no respecter of persons, who loves us all equally, do we believe in divine intervention? Do you have a situation that unless there was divine intervention, the situation isn't going to get any better? There is no answer. We do need that that concept. Do you believe that God will do above and beyond what you could even imagine or think? And so stir within that seed of faith to believe as a child that God is who he said he was and he's come to do what he said he would do. I see Elizabeth and Mary. Now, remember, Elizabeth is the cousin to Mary, the mother of Jesus. Elizabeth is Mary's trusted friend, not only a relative, but they're friends. They're very, very dear friends. But even greater than that, Elizabeth is Mary's mentor. Notice what it says in verse 56. Now, Mary has received the news that she is pregnant with Jesus. At this time, also Elizabeth is well on her way, being pregnant with John the Baptist. And verse 56 says, And Mary abode with her for about three months before she returned to her own house. Now, what do you think those two talked about? Mary immediately, it says, the first person she went to was Elizabeth. Elizabeth stood strong in the faith, and she mentored Mary. Along the way. And now who does Mary go to? Not only a trusted friend to share this miraculous event, but she goes to her mentor who has been so faithful. Even though Elizabeth had no children of her own, she invested her life into spiritual children. And she invested it. How would did she know that her cousin would be the mother of our Lord? Who are you mentoring? Where are you pouring your life into? What will that woman become? What an awesome thing to think that Mary, the mother of Jesus, had a mentor, and here she is. They talked about angels. They talked about, I'm sure that you know how women are. Well, tell me again, what did he say? Tell me exactly what he says. Tell me, what did you say? When he said that, what did he say? Then what did you say? And what? how did you feel? You know how you just kind of get into that. They talked about babies. They talked about God. Three months about this miraculous events that were taking place. They were both expecting babies. These were the two greatest babies that would ever be born in the world. John the Baptist, the forerunner of Christ, and Christ the Messiah, Jesus. That's such an awesome thing. They had a lot to talk about. They talked about the condition of their nation and the condition of the world. They were very in tune with the world in which they lived in. Powerful, powerful thing. I think of the powerful ministry of women mentoring women. That's why I love these groups so much. An opportunity to break up into small groups and apply the lessons that we're learning. The impact that that makes on our lives for God is tremendous. If you're a younger woman in the Lord, or even in age, and you desire to grow in your faith in the Lord, ask God to send you a mentor. Every one of us needs a mentor. I had a mentor. You need a godly mentor to push you to the heights of your walk with the Lord, to 
cause you to be accountable and cause you to stretch and to trust God. If you're an older woman, seek out a younger woman in the Lord that needs your godly counsel. Now, to mentor, let me um, let you know a cue on this or a, a little insight is to really mentor properly, it does take time. And sometimes those people that you're mentoring are going to take away your time. But it is time well in- invested. It's the greatest thing to be able to influence another life, to learn from another life. This is what God has set up. This is the Titus II ministry. We see Elizabeth and Jesus. Elizabeth was a devoted disciple to the Lord Jesus. Do you realize she is the first woman that confessed that Jesus is Lord and Savior? And Jesus is only an embryo when she says that. The power of the Lord in our lives, that's amazing to me. She was a burning and shining light, a powerful witness in a very dark time in history. Her her motto that she lived by was, he must increase and I must decrease. Does that sound familiar to anybody? It's the very thing she taught her son. Elizabeth and her son, John the Baptist, the forerunner of Christ. He was the greatest and the last prophet of the Old Testament. And she poured her life into this child. And the things that he learned caused him to lose his life over it, to lose his life over the, the, the morality and the, and the purity and to follow ha- hard after the Lord. He lost his life because of it. I see Elizabeth as a woman set apart for God. Notice in verse 5 that it says that it was in the days of Herod. Now, Elizabeth lived in a time, and we're looking at history now, Very troubled times. It was a godless society. These Herods that ruled were the worst, most uh, bloodthirsty, godless, cruel men ever to live on the face of the earth. These were the ones that, in fact, uh, the son of this particular Herod is the one that beheaded John the Baptist. They were evil, evil men. They lived in troubled times. There was wars and violence. God had been silent now for 400 years. The last time they had heard from God was the prophecy that he would send the forerunner of Christ, and he would come in the power and the spirit of Elijah. 400 years of silence, not hearing from God. Now you think about the world today that we live in and the mess that it's in and the the, just the perversion and the, the wickedness and how man is so had defiled himself. And God has been speaking for 2,000 years. The Spirit of God is working, and look at the condition we're in. Can you imagine God not speaking for 400 years? They were in troubled times. There was much corruption in the government and even in the church. The priests were perverts. They were into sexual immorality, all kinds of things. It was a faithless, perverse, evil, adulterous generation, and we find a woman choosing to shine forth the light of Jesus in a very dark, dreary horrible, wicked world. It says in verse 5, there was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abiah, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron. She was a descendant of Aaron. Remember Moses, Aaron, and Miriam were all brothers and sisters. She is a descendant of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth, and they were both righteous before God. Now, you can assume because of that they had a great marriage, because they were equally yoked, because they both loved God. They had a good, strong marriage. Walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord. And that speaks of Elizabeth's priorities, that God was first in her life. His word was first in her life. Worship, his people, serving him. She belonged to him and walked with him continually. She walked in his presence continually. She walked in all the commandments and ordinances, all that was required of her, day in and day out, faithfully. And then they add the word, notice, blameless. Wow. What a compliment, the word blameless. Not that she was sinless, but she was blameless. She walked in the presence of God, and her desire was to please him and please, and please only him, and to do that which was right in the sight of God. Of God to please him. The word blameless gives us the idea, not that she doesn't commit sin, that she was perfect in some way. She was human, just like all of us in this room, 
except she had made a decision. She had purposed in her heart to follow the Lord and to do the things that pleased him. It means that she lived above reproach. You could not find or accuse her of doing something evil. She avoided all appearance of evil. And I, that word appearance stands out to me. Avoid, or it says abstain from, all appearance of evil. These things that are questionable, that would cause a question of whether we are really devoted to the Lord or not. Behavior, things that would identify you with the wrong crowd. Our appearance. As women, we are into appearance. Man does look on outward appearance. And outward appearance is important. It's important because the way that we present ourselves and how we look can be a tool that God can use to show what womanhood is really all about. And so how we present ourselves as women. When I got saved many, many years ago and I moved into a Christian house, I, I, was, I came right out of the hippie movement. Got saved right, I was just right out of the hippie movement. And the hippie movement had certain philosophies and beliefs. And not only were they immoral in the freedom, so, so-called, that really became a bondage, but in all that we did, how we dressed, and how we talked, our body language, it was all the philosophy, a false philosophy, so to say, of what would bring happiness. And there was a, as far as dress was concerned, we didn't wear underwear because you had to be free. Not only was it that, but it was the clothes that, was, that were worn were skimpy, if not um, see-through. And that, was the, that was supposed to be, I guess we were trying to be like Adam and Eve. I don't know what we were doing, but anyway. When I moved into the Christian house, when I gave my life to the Lord, there was an instant working to purify me from the inside out. And drastically, my morals changed, my language changed, my dress changed. I realized that these things were wrong. I didn't know they were wrong prior to that. I didn't know that, that I was offending God or sinning against God. I, di- I didn't know that. But as soon as I began to grow in the faith, I realized that to live within that Christian house with my brothers and not to wear underwear or a bra, so to say, and we'll just be very frank about this whole thing, that became a stumbling block to my brothers. And there was no way I would cause another brother to sin because of how I was dressing. And I remember that there was such a conviction. And what I ended up doing was put on a bathing suit top to cover myself, to keep me firm instead of floppy, you know, this kind of a thing. But I wanted to be sure that it wasn't me that was causing another to sin because he was looking on me in a way that I was, in my appearance, how I was presenting myself until I could get the proper underwear. That was just a conviction of God's spirit to be conscious of how I dressed and how I looked. You see, I was no longer a hippie. Now I was a child of God. And there was that sense of of purity in, in every aspect. I was to present my body as a living sacrifice. And my body is to bring glory to God. We live in an age of coming out. We see women coming out of the clothes that they wear or their body parts being exposed by the clothes that they wear. Body parts that ought not to be coming out or being seen, whether that's a tight-fitting garment or it's too loose and it's and, and parts of the, the female body are showing that ought not to be showing. It's called, we're in this age of coming out, coming out of the closet. The homosexual movement is well on its way. And we are being forced in an in a era of tolerance. Sex sells everything. It doesn't matter if they're selling a car or they're selling a bar of soap. It is sex, sex, sex. It is so perverted in the world today. Where is the innocence? Where is the beauty of womanhood, how it is supposed to be? I'm not talking about wearing clothes up to the neck and down to the, you know, 
um, ankles and, and not being in style, but there is a proper way to present these bodies that God has given us to such a way that we do not stumble our brothers, nor are we a stumbling block in the world. And we bring glory to God and we, we raise up the standard of women, womanhood. The exploitation of children, little girls, being exploited on the Internet as models when it is so sexual. It is sick. We are in a sick society. And as women, we are not to look or dress like prostitutes, and neither are we to look or dress like a homosexual or a lesbian. There is such... We are so infiltrated by the world. We are so conditioned that these things are tolerable that we are accepting them in our own lives, and it not ought to be. There was a commercial for J.C. Penney's, and it was for a teenager getting dressed uh, for school. And she comes out, and she's got a little midriff um, top on and her little uh, hip hugger, you know, bell-bottom jeans. And her mother and says, where do you think you're going? And she says, well, I'm going to school. And the mother says, oh, no, you're not. You're not going to school looking like that. And she walks up to her daughter, and she pulls down the tube top so that the crevice of the breast is showing, pulls it up to underneath the breast, pulls the hip huggers down to the top of the hairline, and she says, now you're ready for school. Well, that commercial was taken off of the air because Christians said, that is perverse. What is happening in the world today? How are we presenting ourselves? Blameless means I avoid all appearance of evil. Man does look on the outward. And that God, just as when I came, became a Christian, it was the Spirit of God that taught me how to dress. To be sexy or seductive is really an avenue that the enemy will use not only to bring harm to myself, but to stumble others. That we don't want but rather to, to really be educated by the Lord of how we ought to dress. Elizabeth remained steadfast, and none of these things moved her. She was blameless in this corrupt environment. We can do it too. Verse 7 says, And they had no child, but Elizabeth was barren, and they both were now well stricken in years. These words, that she has no child, and that she was barren, and now she was too old to have children. These words are full of heartbreak and disappointment. It speaks of broken dreams and, and shattered hopes. And yet, in spite of her right standing with God, Elizabeth is denied her heart's desire. That's hard. When you are in a situation, you're serving the Lord, and a heart's desire is not fulfilled. It is lacking not only that, but but way it made it worse was her age, because now the situation became hopeless. There was no hope for a child now, because she had passed the age of childbearing. It was beyond that hoping, that, that hopeless situation. I think of the hopelessness that we might find ourselves in today. And yet again, Elizabeth learned from Sarah's life. Abraham and Sarah. Abraham said that he hoped beyond hope. What in the world does that mean, to hope beyond hope? It means that we have a hope beyond this world. In the world, it would look, it would look hopeless. Maybe being diagnosed with a deadly disease. My situation is hopeless. The relationship is hopeless. These things that really worldly or, or, or humanly seems to be without hope. And yet my hope is beyond what is human or within the human thinking because we have a living hope. It is a hope that is broken upon our hearts by the Spirit of God. It's a living hope in God, the God of the impossible. She hoped beyond hope. Because she had a living hope. We need that living hope in our lives. We need the Spirit of God to birth within us hope in our hopeless situations. To give those hopeless situations to God and let him work out what he wants to do through them. To ignite within us hope when there is no hope. I know that Elizabeth had living hope because she does not become bitter because of her situation. 
Nor is she jealous. She isn't jealous because Mary was picked to have the Messiah rather than her. I mean, she was older, wiser, more experienced. Why would a 14-year-old, 15 or 16-year-old be responsible to raise the Messiah? When Elizabeth was well advanced in age, wouldn't she be more capable in just experiencing life to raise Jesus? But Elizabeth wasn't jealous. She didn't waver. She wasn't lacking in her service to the Lord because she knew that this barrenness was an opportunity for God to do the impossible. There was no hesitation on Elizabeth's part. No doubt when she received the too-good-to-be-true news that she was going to conceive a child. Verse 24 says, And after those days his wife Elizabeth conceived and hid herself five months, saying, Thus hath the Lord dealt with me in the days wherein he looked on me. In other words, that He looked with compassion. His eyes never left Elizabeth to be gracious to her to take away my reproach among men. The question is, what is the too good to be true news in your life? Whether you're dealing with an impossible situation, a situation that seems to be hopeless, a shattered hope, a broken dream. I don't know. What is it? What in your life is is the too good to be true news? The first thing I see in this verse is that God has taken away our reproach. Does your reproach need to be taken away? The word taken away means to wipe away, to cause to disappear. That which robbed you of your dignity as a woman, he has come to wipe that away. It's all covered under the blood. Your mistakes, your sins, the decisions that you made, the things that you caused in your own life to take away your dignity as a woman or that which took away your innocence, it's all covered in the blood. He has taken away the reproach. He's taken away that thing that degraded you, and he has raised you to a place through the blood of Jesus, of dignity, and of honor. To give to us, he's come to give to us something that is too good to be true. Maybe you think that you're too old to to start something new and exciting. Maybe you think it's too late to to start again. I'm too old to start over, so to say. Maybe you think that you're well past the age of expecting to marry or to have a child. Whatever it is that seems to be too good to be true for you, would you remember Elizabeth? And would God stir within you as you look at her story and you see how God worked. He had, to, he had to wait. The timing had to be right. It was all part of his plan. But when we remember Elizabeth, it stirs within us to believe in miracles and to pray with expectancy. That your prayers mean something. They're not just dropping to the ground. They're reaching the ears of God. And his eyes are upon us. He hears every cry. He, has, he hears every groan, and we pray with expectancy. When the prayer is prayed, it's because that is what's on your heart. And in his time, he makes all things beautiful. I have a promise for you from the Lord. Elizabeth gave to Mary a prophetic word, and this prophetic word, this word of wisdom, this word of knowledge has gone down through the centuries, and it's for every woman that's sitting in this room tonight. And I want you to write down this word, these words. Blessed is she that believes. Would you write that down? Big. Blessed is she that believes. There's the key. I must believe in the God of the impossible. I must believe in divine intervention. I must believe that God wants to do above and beyond what I could ever imagine or think. I so limit God because I want it to be done a certain way at a certain time. But if I would just let God have his way. He would do above and beyond what I could ever imagine or think. Blessed is she that believes. Look at verse 45. The word says, and this is what Elizabeth said to Mary. Blessed. That word blessed means happy or to be envied. Is she that believed. All it takes is simple faith in a great, big, huge, wonderful, awesome God. A God that is so much greater than we are greater than our hopelessness, greater than our problems, and can fix anything as we commit those things to him. 
happy, to be envied, is she that believes, for there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. What the Lord has spoken, what the Lord has said, in his time he will accomplish. Those heart's desires, those hopeless situations, God wants to work in these places. Those places of impossibility, that's the opportunity for God to work in a great way. I end with the words of these poems, of the words of this poem, and it says, The Lord is sure to accomplish those things a loving heart has waited long to see. Those words will be fulfilled to which she clings. The Lord is sure to accomplish those things, O burdened heart, rest ever in his care. In quietness beneath his shadowing wings, await the answer to your longing prayer. When you have cast your cares, the heart then sings, the Lord is sure to accomplish those things. Let's pray. Father, we just need that hope stirred up within us. Thank you that you give us a living hope. Lord, you teach us how to be women. You teach us how to bring back womanhood in the way that we look, in our appearance, our language, our, our just everything about us. And then you pour in hope in the situations that we see as hopeless. Thank you for those situations, Lord because it just gives you an opportunity to work. We thank you that you said you will accomplish the things that you have promised. Thank you for these heart's desires. Lord, I believe some of the women in here have lost hope, and Lord, these desires have died, and you've resurrected them tonight. Do a mighty awesome work. Oh, God, may we be women that say, yes, my God is a God of miracles. My God is faithful, and he is true. And his word does work if we would just believe. Blessed is she that believes the word of the Lord. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.